Good morning, and welcome to First Presbyterian Church. Um, obviously, something's a little different this morning. Uh, Pastor Martin's not here. So, um, today you have me uh, there in Orlando moving Faith to RTS, um, where she'll start school this week. She's actually been in class for the whole summer. So, be in prayer for them as uh, they're taking care of her, and be in prayer for her as she begins uh, school in Orlando. One thing that I want to make you aware of, uh, next week, Sunday night at 5.30 on August 30th, we're going to have a special communion service. So uh, this is actually going to be the first opportunity for our new confirmation class and covenant class who you saw um, presented, who, who you will see presented next week. Uh, this will be the first opportunity for them uh, to take communion. And uh, so we invite you. That's going to be a short service just from 5.30 to 6. So we invite you to join us. All right. Let us worship God. Would you stand with me for the call to worship? Restore us, O God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. It sent out branches to the sea and its shoots to the river. Why then have you broken down its walls, so that all who pass along the way pluck its fruit? The boar from the forest ravages it, and all that move in the field feed on it. Turn again, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven and see. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you today that you've gathered us once again together to worship you, to honor you, to praise you, so that we can be built up in your love and your grace. So we ask you today that you would uh, grant grace to us, that you would wash us in your word, that you would show us your will, so that starting today, each and every day, we can live in accordance with your word, in accordance with your will, and so that we can uh, live for your glory, to build your kingdom, and to serve you with all of our lives. So bless us this morning with your Holy Spirit, and we ask that you would care for us and show us your way. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And now would you be seated uh, for a silent meditation on God of grace and God of glory.
Good morning. Um, so I'm going to tell you a story this morning about, since school is starting this week for some, about when I was in fifth grade, my parents moved me to a new school. And I was very nervous. I knew one person in the entire school. And the first day of school at lunch, some girls were kind of picking on me. And I got up, dropped my plate everywhere. And all of the children laughed at me. And I just sat there. And as I started crying, trying to pick it up, one girl in the sixth grade stood up, came over, and helped me clean my plate. And the kids stopped laughing because apparently this girl had been there forever and they knew her. She helped me clean it up, took it, threw it away, and walked away. I have never forgotten that. And last year I reached out to her. She lives in Texas now. And I said, do you remember this? And guess what, guys? She had no idea what I was talking about. And I said, you made an impression on my life. You did one act of kindness and I will never forget it. And she said, I thank you for that, but I do not remember that at all. So I'm going to read a Bible verse to you. First Thessalonians 5.11. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. So this week, I know some kids are starting fifth grade, it's a new school building, or maybe you're going to the partnership school, or maybe you have some new children in your class, or maybe there are kids that you've known forever who are having a hard time. Look and find one time that you can be kind. Maybe smile at someone. Maybe say, hey, I'm glad you're here, and you have absolutely no idea how that person will feel. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today, Lord, and thank you, um, for the opportunity we have, Lord, to start school again and to get back into a routine, see our friends, Lord, and to shine your light. Please help us to look for opportunities, God, to show your love and love of Jesus to others. Help us to shine and all glory go to you, Lord. Thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. So I'll just ask you to remain seated this morning for our affirmation of faith. This is from the Westminster Larger Catechism, questions 152 and 153. What does every sin deserve from God? Since even the least sin goes against the sovereignty, goodness, and holiness of God, and goes against his righteous law, every sin deserves God's wrath and curse both in this life and the life to come. 
that wrath and curse cannot be expiated except by the blood of Christ. What does God require from us to escape his wrath and curse, which we deserve for our sin? God requires from us, in order for us to escape his wrath and curse, that we deserve for our sin, repentance in our relationship to him, and faith in our relationship toward Jesus Christ, along with the diligent involvement in all the external ways Christ uses us, bringing to us the benefits of his mediation. Let's pray together. God of grace and God of glory, we come to you humbly today, recognizing the ways that we've failed you, the ways that we've sinned, and the ways that we're weak. And we bring all of these things to you and humbly ask that you would forgive us. We repent. And we ask for your hand to be placed back on us. We thank you for your continued provision for us. That you've given us grace and salvation, even in the midst of all of our failings. And we ask that you continue to bless us in this world that is difficult and hard. In a world that is facing uh, great trials. We ask that you would grant us courage and wisdom to face those trials. We pray for those in Lebanon, particularly our, our missionaries there that are uh, dealing with the ramifications of the recent events. We ask that they would be a light in Beirut, that your name would be proclaimed in the midst of this tragedy, and that we would see people come to Christ despite all of the pain and suffering. We also pray for uh, our local missions and our Christian preschool as they continue to navigate uh, coronavirus and how to handle health. We ask that you would bless them, give them wisdom, and give them uh, strength to face any challenges that come their way. We also thank you for your provision and healing of Pee Wee Kynard and uh, their family. We ask that you continue to, to heal him. We also ask that as we rejoice in his uh, coming home, that uh, you would also heal and care for the other, other physical and spiritual needs for those on our prayer list and otherwise. We know that you have power to heal, and so we ask that you would pour out your healing. We thank you that you've gathered us together so that we can come under the teaching of your word, so that we can uh, unite with one voice, to praise you, to worship you. And we ask that you would continue to allow us to do that, uh, even as we face uncertainty in the coming days. And so, together we join in saying your prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and power and the glory forever. Amen. Today's scripture is Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. I invite you to turn there with me in your Bible or your electronic device. Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. At this point in the book of Isaiah, we're still in the introduction, um, essentially. And this song in verses, in verses 1 through 7 is sort of like the climax to the introduction. Prior to this, Isaiah has been giving indictments and promising judgment against Israel for their sin and for their immorality. And when we come to this chapter, chapter 5, Isaiah is kind of culminating all of this together and giving us... Uh, a, bit, a better picture of what exactly the problem is. So join with me and hear the word of the Lord. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. 
My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. For righteousness, but behold, an outcry. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We ask that uh, as we come under the teaching of it, that you would show us your way and pour out your Holy Spirit on us to see what you have for us. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you've been here for any length of time, uh, you know that this is First Presbyterian Church. It's on the sign. We're, we're Presbyterian. If you've been here for maybe slightly longer, you know that we are evangelical Presbyterians. And what that means, the, kind of the core doctrine that we embrace is the doctrine of salvation by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And so it's, it's very natural for us to think of salvation as a positional thing. You're either in or you're out, like a, like a light switch. You're on or off. And that's very true, and I, I'm grateful for that reality because we have security and safety in Christ because of his work and what he's done. But that's not the end of what the Bible says about salvation and faith. The Bible also says that faith without works is dead. And that a vine that doesn't bear fruit is going to be cut off. And that the man who hears the words of God and does them will be like one who builds his house on solid rock. So we have this obligation. There's a positional reality where we're in or out. But once we're in, we have a continued obligation to fruitfulness. And so the question has to be, in light of this obligation, what do we do? How, how can a Christian be fruitful in fulfilling God's call? And so if we think about our light switch, if I come in the room and I, I turn on the lights, what happens when I turn on the lights, when I flip the switch? Well, the light bulbs all light up and we have power. But the light switch isn't the thing providing the power. If I pull the light switch off the wall and start flipping it, nothing's going to happen. And so there's an outside source that brings power into the room and lights up the lights. In the same way, our fruitfulness has an, has an outside source. Our fruitfulness flows from God's grace. And this positional reality, the, the fact that we are secure in Christ also prov provides us with a directional reality, where we're going. And so today, as we look in Isaiah 5, we're going to see a people who have failed to be fruitful. They have yielded wild grapes. And we can learn how to be fruitful from their failings. So the first thing, we're going to find fruitfulness in God's common blessings on the church. Look at verse 1 and 2 for me. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. So God shows this covenant of people Israel... And he made a bunch of promises to them. He promised land. He gave them the law and the prophets. He gave them his word. He gave them uh, a system of sacrifice to commune with him. He gave them prayer. And what's interesting about all these things is that 
none of God's blessings and none of God's gifts in, in this regard were given to Israel because of their obedience. All of these gifts were given before Israel had shown any interest in God, before they'd uh, done anything to earn these blessings. They were totally gracious blessings. In fact, God actually knew ahead of time that Israel was going to be disobedient. Moses prophesies about this in Deuteronomy 32. And in spite of that, in spite of the fact that God knew they were going to sin, he kept his covenant promises. And so we can take uh, hope in that. We can, we can hope in the fact that God has, is a promise-keeping, covenant-keeping God. And that despite our disobedience, he's going to continue to bless us. So why did he give these blessings, though? If he knew they were going to be disobedient, if he knew they were going to fail, there was still a reason for it. He gave these blessings because these are the things that nourish and make fruitful a people. So, you know, if, if you're building a vineyard and, and you put in, uh, if you clear the land, you pick out a nice fertile hill, you build infrastructure, walls and towers and wine press, you, you're looking for it to yield fruit, right? You're, you're investing in the vineyard because you're expecting the vineyard to produce something. And so when God is investing in Israel and when he invests in us as the church, he, he's not doing so uh, just kind of because he feels like it. I mean, he, he does feel like it, but he, there's, a, there's a goal in mind in blessing us, and it's fruitfulness. When I, was, when I graduated high school, um, I went with two friends to the Grand Canyon, and we were... Uh, young, and we, we thought, you know, we play pickup soccer once a week, and so we're healthy. And at the Grand Canyon, they have all these rules. One of those rules is you don't hike between 10 and 4, because it's dangerous. And we thought, you know what, we can do it. I mean, that's really for the people that are kind of unhealthy, that don't know what they're getting into, and so that's not a big deal. We'll just be careful, and we'll be okay. So, Another thing about the Grand Canyon is it's like a reverse mountain. So normally when you're climbing a mountain, you would climb up, do the hard part first, and then turn around and go back down. But the Grand Canyon is the opposite. You go down first, that's the easy part, and then the hard part is on the way back. So we left about 8 o'clock in the morning, and we hiked five miles and an hour and a half downhill. And we got to the spot where we were going to turn around and come back. And you can see where this is going. We, about 10 o'clock, we started to climb back up, the time when you're not supposed to go. And one of our friends decided he wasn't going to drink water. He, he said, we, we all had a, we had a lot of water. We, it was, we had two or three bottles apiece. And he said, the water, it, it, the sun has heated it up, and it's not very refreshing. It doesn't taste like the water from the stream we just had. So I'm just going to wait till we get to the next water station, which was almost at the top. And I'll drink water there, and I'll be okay. And by the time we got to the water station, he was severely dehydrated. Um, as you would imagine. And kind of the funny thing is, it's not for a lack of water. We, we all had like two or three liters of water apiece. But because the water wasn't kind of this fresh, new, delicious water from the stream, he said, I, I don't really want that water. I don't want the water that's going to sustain me up to the top. I don't want the water that's going to keep me healthy up to the top. I just want kind of the fresh water from the water stations. In the same way, if we decide, you know what, God has given us all these blessings, and um, he's given us a Bible, he's given us a church, he's given us things like baptism and the Lord's Supper to kind of remind us of, of who we are in him and what he's done. You know, I know he gives us all those things, but kind of like, it's kind of hard to get to church at 9.30 on a Sunday, and, you know, if, if I have to, if I'm going to pray, I have to like set aside like 10, 15 minutes a day to, to do that at least. And you know, that's kind of a, a struggle because you know, I've, I've got to like make breakfast and get ready for work and stuff like that. But that's not going to sustain you, is it? If you're relying on kind of, I'm going to come to church once a month and we're going to have a great spiritual experience. Or I'm going to go to a camp or a retreat and have a, a great experience. If you're relying on that, that's not going to sustain you. 
And that's, that doesn't stop being true, particularly in our, our situation with, with coronavirus. It, it's still true that these blessings that God has given us are his prescribed way of sustaining us and making us fruitful. And if we neglect God's provision for us, if we reject God's provision like Israel did, then we have no hope. We have no hope of being fruitful. When God gives us his grace, if we reject it, he, he doesn't just continue to give his grace. And so this is the second thing. We find fruitfulness in leaving behind the wilderness. So you'll notice that <laughs> there's a problem in verses 3 and 4. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? So the, the problem is not necessarily that there are wild grapes. You know, you, you can find those. They're, they'll appear naturally, um, not around here. But the problem is that God set an expectation for fruitfulness. He set an expectation for good grapes that you would expect from a vineyard that, that are cultivated, that are good for eating or making wine. He expected good grapes, and he got wild grapes. That's the core of the problem. It's not that there were wild grapes. Wild grapes are something that you expect. And you're probably familiar with uh, the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians, where the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Whenever I, we've, we've been doing confirmation, the, whenever I ask what the fruits of the Spirit, I'm sorry, I, I, get that, I get that song back. But that's, that's a cute little song, but Paul is actually comparing two things. He's comparing the fruit of the Spirit, but right before that, he's, he talks about the fruit of the flesh. And he's saying, if you're in Christ, you have to flee from the fruit of the flesh and run to the fruit, fruit of the Spirit. You can't, if you're in Christ, you, you can't continue to live in the flesh. And so for a lot of us, that's, it, it may seem like, you know, I, Part of the problem with, with Israel at this time that Isaiah was kind of attacking is they were going to church, they were you know, going, doing sacrifices, and they were doing obligatory prayers. They're kind of doing this like perfunctory obligation thing where they, I'm, I'm going to go, I'm going to do my thing, I'm going to um, kind of pay, pay my respects to God, but we've also got these other pagan gods, and I've got like my secular life too. And so they, they had what kind of looked like good fruit. I'm doing the things that God said to do. But that good fruit, when you bit into it, was actually fruit of the flesh. They were, they were not honoring God to honor God. They were honoring God because they were trying to avoid judgment. They were trying to keep God happy so that they could uh, continue to, to um, thrive in the land. And so it's, we have these wild insiders, people that are uh, in the church, or in this case in Israel, and they are profaning God's name by bearing wild fruit, fleshly fruit, when they should be bearing spiritual good fruit. And so what does God do? In verses 5 and 6 we see, And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it should be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it should be trampled down. I will make it a waste, it shall not be pruned or hoed, and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they rain, no rain upon it. So what does God do when he sees, when he finds wild grapes in his vineyard? Now, he would be perfectly, it would be perfectly reasonable for him to just, like, destroy the vineyard himself, to rain down fire on him. And he did that before, he did it with Sodom and Gomorrah, but he doesn't do that. Notice what he does. When he finds wild grapes, he removes the hedge. He breaks down the wall. He stops pruning and hoeing, and he, he lets briars and thorns grow up. All God is doing here, and this is a very godly way of doing it, a way that we wouldn't think of, He's simply allowing the wild grapes to continue to be wild. He says, look, vineyard, if you're going to produce wild grapes, 
if you're going to produce grapes that I can't use, if you want to be like the wilderness, you can have the wilderness. I'll tear down the walls and the hedges and we'll have wild animals come in and chew you up and beat you down. We'll, we'll let the briars and thorns grow up and suffocate you. If you want to be like everyone else, have at it. And this is prophetically pointing to the Assyrian invasion of Israel, where uh, this great power who's conquering the world, what God says, Israel, if you want to be like the rest of the world, the rest of the world is coming under the dominion of the Assyrians. And so they're going to conquer you. If you want to be wild like everyone else, let me show you what wilderness looks like. And this isn't like just kind of an Old Testament thing. If we look in Romans 1, Paul says that God gives the ungodly over to their sin three different times. God's ordinary way of, of judging is not to uh, smite people. His ordinary way of judging is just to let them sin. Because sin and worldliness and fleshliness is judgment in and of itself. And so God is pouring this out. So several times kind of growing up, we had um, kind of wild animals get in our house. One time, one Christmas morning, we had a, a baby squirrel in our Christmas tree. And so we have a, a 45 minute tape of us chasing around a squirrel on Christmas morning. Um, but I'll tell you, when we, when we found that squirrel, or when you've, we, that's happened a hundred times, if you find a wild animal in your house, what do you do? Do you say, okay, here's, I'm going to give you some food, I'm going to give you some water, make you a little bed, and here's your corner of the house. Okay, now you stay in that corner, I'm going to go live my life, and you can have just this little corner. You can make a nest there, and I won't bother you. Now maybe some of you do that, but that's, that's not the ordinary way of handling that situation, is it? Because what happens if you make a, a nest for this wild animal? Pretty soon that corner turns into like maybe a whole room. And then one room turns into two rooms, turns into the whole house. And then all of a sudden you've got a wild animal that's like eating food out of your pantry and uh, maybe biting you and chewing up your furniture. There's a reason you have walls and doors on your house. Those, those walls are what separate the outdoors from the indoors. Like outside is wild and inside is tame. And if you let the wilderness inside your house, you've lost the, the tameness, right? You've lost the domestic nature of the house. And all of a sudden, what was supposed to be a safe place, a place of fruitfulness and growth, a place free from the dangers of the wilderness, it's all of a sudden there's no difference. It's the same. And so we can't let the wilderness encroach in our lives and in our churches. We have to get the wilderness out. And in the wilderness, the, you know, the wild does what it does. And that's okay. It's, our goal is to, to tame it. But out there, we don't really need to, to worry about it, right? The, the concern is when the wild and the tame cross over. When the wild gets in to the tame. When, it, when the wilderness gets into the vineyard. And so, if we're going to honor God, we have to eradicate wildness from our lives. We have to eradicate fleshliness from our lives. And finally, we find fruitfulness in the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. So, we've identified a problem. There's wild grapes in the vineyard. So if you find wild grapes in your vineyard, what do you do? Do you fertilize it and say, maybe if I take care of this, maybe if I maybe tie it up and kind of try to get it, get it in line with the rest of the grapes, that maybe, maybe then, if I, if I get it with the right group, that it'll start being fruitful. Maybe it'll start producing grapes that I can use if I just kind of take care of it some more. No. The only way is to tear it up. If you, if you ever see like a wild grapevine, it, it doesn't look like a, a tame grapevine. You know, if you go out to somewhere where they have vineyards, 
They'll have them in rows. They're tied up nice and neat. They have big, juicy grapes. But if you go out into the, the woods and you find a grape vine, it, it doesn't look like that. It's, it's probably tangled up in a tree. It, it has these like tiny, hard grapes that you can't eat. They're not the same plant. They're, they're different. And so if you find wild grapes in your vineyard, you have to tear them up and replant them. There's, there's no other way. That's, that's the only way to get the grapes out, is to, to tear them up and replace them with new ones. So if you think about like in, in Matthew 18, when Jesus talks about if your hand causes you to sin to cut it off, or if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out, you've probably heard that explained, and this, there's a, some reality to this, that Jesus is simply saying, just flee from sin, stay as far away from sin as you can, as you can get, because sin is bad. And that's true. He is saying that on one level. But there's another layer to it. D does your hand cause you to sin? If I cut off my hand and throw it on the floor, what's it going to do? Is it going to commit a crime just laying on the floor? No. My hand is just skin and bones, flesh. It doesn't have a will. My hand does not cause me to sin. My heart does. My, my heart is, is the root that's producing fleshly fruit. And the point Jesus is making there is, it does no good to cut off your hand or couch out your eye. That's why we all have two eyes and two hands, right? The point Jesus is making is you can't, you can't root out sin in your life. The only way to do it is for your heart to be cut out. You need a heart transplant. You need your heart of stone removed and replaced with a heart of flesh. And the Holy Spirit does that. You have to turn to the, the Holy Spirit, to the cross. And, and what the Holy Spirit does is he takes your sinful, stony heart, hangs it on the cross with Christ, buries it in the grave, and raises you to life with a new heart. So Paul says we were buried with Christ by baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised, we might also walk in newness of life. Death is necessary. You have to die to yourself. The Holy Spirit literally has to kill you in order for you to be fruitful. This is an act of God's sovereign grace. And so when we get to verse 7, for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. The men of Judah are his pleasant planting. He looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. For righteousness, but behold, an outcry. It's a very bleak ending to that song. There's no hope there. God was looking for, for tame, good fruit. And what he got instead was wild, no good fruit. Fleshly fruit. Fruit that was just like everything else. And I'll tell you, if you look at the rest of this chapter... It doesn't get any better. It's actually, the, the chapter is called, the, the section is called the woes, the seven woes. And it only gets worse because Israel didn't have the blessing of the Holy Spirit. Israel didn't have um, the same access and fellowship to God that we have. And in God's providence, at this point in history, he's, he's judging them. He presented them with a choice. Either be fruitful or be destroyed. And he presents us with that same choice. Be fruitful or be destroyed. There's, there's no such thing as a, a faith that doesn't honor God. There's no such thing as a faith in God that just kind of pays perfunctory attention to him or just does the things that it's supposed to do, but doesn't really, you know, love God or honor God. There's no room for that. Be fruitful or be destroyed. And that's, it. that's kind of the core question, isn't it? Am I going to turn to Christ? Am I going to honor Christ? Or am I not? And so we kind of come full circle here. 
this positional thing, the, the light switch, where you're either in or you're out, there's, there's a directional reality to that. If you are in, then you honor God. There's, there's no way to be in, in Christ, regenerated by the Holy Spirit, and not honor God. It's be fruitful or be destroyed. And so if, if you're concerned about that, if you think, you know, maybe I haven't been as fruitful as I need to be, I encourage you to repent. Turn to Christ. And let the Holy Spirit continue to kill your old heart with him so that you can be resurrected new every day, so you can be transformed from one degree of glory to another. Turn to Christ and repent. There's, there's no other way. The Holy Spirit, you can't do your own heart transplant. The Holy Spirit has to do it. And so turn to him. Turn to him in love. Turn to him in faith. And, and plead with him that he would do a new work in your life. We find fruitfulness in God's grace alone. God's grace saves us and sustains us throughout our entire Christian walk. There's no other way. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, you are good and gracious. You pour out your grace on us constantly. And we ask that you would give us hearts that don't reject it. Give us hearts that are made new in your spirit. Hearts that love you and honor you and want to see love, joy, peace, patience, goodness in our lives. Make us new. Only you can do it. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And now hear God's blessing to us. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us that your way may be known on earth and your saving power among all nations. Amen. Thank you.